work out a mounting on the TR6 that mounted it. It was just a strip of metal and it mounted to the seat pivot point. Same thing. Clip, go. Okay, thank you. TR6 because that's what I've had for years to play with, but um, some things for, for some of the other models as well, and of course a lot of the things carry over into the other models, uh, things that fit the TR6. Uh. So, um, we'll start with suspension. Um, one of the popular items right now is replacement of the rear hub. Uh, a lot of the cars uh, are uh, with the age or experiencing failures of rear hubs, uh, that's becoming more and more uh, prevalent. Uh, this is what the inside of the original rear hub looks like. That's what's supporting your wheel. Um, the flange fits on the tapered uh, shank there. The driving force goes through a quarter inch key. What happens, uh, I've seen them already to twist off that key. Uh, more commonly, just inside of this taper, because of the flexing of this relatively skinny shaft, eventually this material will fatigue right here and then break off. There's nothing holding your wheel on at that point and your wheel leaves the car, so the results are catastrophic. Uh, I've designed replacement rear hubs that are much stronger. Uh, they use, a, instead of the two tapered roller bearings on here, on the original, they use a, a double row ball bearing. <coughs> Um, these are the inner races to the ball bearing here, and I brought this along to show the diameter of what is supporting your wheel with this setup. So you torque up the big nut on here to 250 foot-pounds. Uh, well, I, I torque it up before I ship it out, but that squeezes all this together, and the inner races of the bearing, and everything is, is contributing to the diameter of what's holding your wheel. So hard to imagine that breaking off and losing a wheel. So is there much any lubrication issue with that? I mean, any? Is there, there's not. It's not. <coughs> right? No, factory sealed, just like every modern car today. You know, factory sealed unit. Uh, these have uh, a lot of your cars today have the the bearing housing, like this aluminum part, would actually be a be cast or whatever, and it would be machined for the balls to run right in that. Uh, what I'm using here is I should have brought one along, but it's a, a wide ball bearing with a, with a hardened steel outer race and inner race. These are the inner races. Um, the balls are angular contact, so they, you know, the force is kind of on the ends there. So um, that's a completely replaceable ball bearing. So you can, if, if you ever need to, take the big nut off. This pulls right out. Then you'd, be, you'd have this with the, with the housing on. You'd press, the, press this apart. That ruins the bearing, which you Placing anyway, and then take and pull the inner race off of there, put it, press the new bearing on, press it back together, and you're good to go. So it's a common, common bearing. These hubs use the original U joint, so if you're keeping the original half shaft, just replace the hub. Uh, that's a nice upgrade. I make them with different length studs in here, so these are a little bit longer than the original studs. Um, a lot of people like them for alloy wheels, gives you a little better thread engagement. Uh, I make them with the, just cut them off to, for the stock length, or there's an ARP stud that fits in here too if you want the fancy. Uh, they're extra long for racing, or you can cut them off. And they bolt, bolt directly into the trailing arm, just, just like the original hub. Um, the studs that mount this in the trailing arm, uh, maybe you've dealt with those already, it's a 5 16 stud, and it's fine thread, threaded into the aluminum trailing arm. Um, to me, that's uh, not very good grip in the trailing arm. Uh, a 5 16 fine thread ends up with about 12,000 steep threads cut into the aluminum, very narrow, fine 24 threads per inch. They don't hold in there very well. You've got to be real careful with the torque of these nuts or you'll pull the studs out of the trailing arm in time to get some corrosion in the aluminum. Um, there's been cases where driving down the road, the, the hub pulls out of the trailing arm because the studs pulled out. So folks will uh, 
use a thread repair, a helicoil, or a keemser to, to, to fix those up. Still left with just the 5 16 stud, which is a little bit small to me. I like to drill the trailing arm out and thread it 3 8 coarse thread and put a grade 8 2 inch long stud in there uh, in its place. 3 8 inch coarse thread has more like a 30,000 steep thread instead of 12,000, so a lot more grip that's coarser, so you have more aluminum between the threads so it doesn't pull out. So that's, that's the way I like to upgrade them. Um, Talking about the axles, uh, Mike mentioned some of the, the drawbacks with the original half shaft. Uh, of course, the, the hub portion of it is, is really part of it. The other thing that um, you have with a U-joint like this, when a U-joint is operating at an angle, there's a velocity change as, the, as it rotates. And of course, we're, we're always operating at some angle on the, on the, on the wheels. Um, so the, the half shaft is actually speeding up and slowing down as it rotates, every time it rotates. If the wheel is straight up and down, zero camber, zero toe, that will equalize back out as the wheel is rotating smoothly. But how often do we have zero camber? You know, you, when you take off the wheel squat, it's a big power loss because it's trying to speed up and slow down that wheel as it's rotating. And that's where he mentioned the CV axles, that's where CV axles come in. They're a lot more efficient because CV, constant velocity, it does not have that change in velocity as it's rotating. Um, you mentioned the BMW setup. My take on the on the axles, I make up a CV axle. I didn't bring any along because I'm, I'm waiting on a shipment of the CV joints right now. I don't have any, but they're coming in next week. I use uh, this same hub, just like this. CV joint here, you know, slips into the spline like that. These, of course, the driving force goes through this spline instead of just a two-way. And, uh, and then a CV joint on the inner end with an adapter to go to the original differential. So uh, I have that whole axle setup available to work with the stock differential. I also sell uh, a Nissan differential from a, like an Infiniti 245 or 300CX, depending on what ratio you want and the mounting brackets to mount that differential into the TR6 uh, or STAG or TVR. The GT6s have the rotoflex. Now the rotoflex doesn't have the same problem as the universal, right? Right, right. The rotoflex but they <coughs> eliminates that problem. Yeah, they don't have the velocity change like that. They do use the U-joint at the one. So that's the favorite the first ones to come up with. Yeah. <laughs> That's the velocity growth factor. Folks have asked if I've done a CV jo joint conversion for the GT6 to replace the road of I have not, just because I haven't had a car to work with. I've, oh, they're not. Yeah, i told a couple of people, if you can bring the car in, or at least the suspension components for me to work with, I'll try to engineer something. Uh, Richard, did that also, that setup also work on the TR250? Yes, yes. 250, same, same rear end component. TR4A, IRS, same rear end component. All, all carried over. We have a TR250 over there in the paint area that has his um, rear setup with the uh, disc brakes and all that. So if you wanted to take a look at it, it's, it's over there. So. Yeah. Uh, Freeman. Uh, suspension upgrades. Um, you're talking about the, the bushings there. Uh, I make a nylotron bushing. That's a step up from the polyurethane. Nylotron is a hard material. It's made to be a berry material, so it's it's uh, made for rubbing action like that. Very good wear characteristics. Um, it will eliminate that, that rear end twitch thing he was talking about from the original rubber bushings in the trailing arm squishing. Uh, so that's, I also have them for the front end, a uh, complete front suspension kit with the nylotron bushings. And <coughs> Is there any lubrication you would recommend? Yes, yes. Use not real fussy about what kind of grease on these. And I do use a stainless steel sleeve, so you're not having to worry about rusting of the sleeve that's going through there and wiping out the bushings because the sleeve rusted. So. I've asked the plastics company about grease for the Nylotron. They said it's not fussy about the kind of grease. So you can use a synthetic grease or, you know, whole different kinds, whatever you want to say, right? So it's just actually a grease that's on the, the wearing surface of the Nylon? Well, you have something that's in the sleeve to prevent corrosion and rust and <laughs> No, no, it's just uh, you grease it when you put it together. And, uh, and I'm just saying because this 
sleeves are stainless steel, you don't have to worry about moisture getting in there and rusting it like that. And still lubricating in the crease on top of that. Yes, you would when you would press the you press the bushings into the trailing arm or from each side, grease them inside. You know, don't grease in the trailing arm, the bushing's not going to turn in the trailing arm. And then stick the sleeve through here and then uh, you know grease the ends a little bit. And, um, it's really for assembly. Yeah, assembly grease. Much, right? Yeah. Right. And for operation. What I like to do on the on the rears, I like to drill the trailing arms right here and put a grease fitting in. And the grease will be pumped right in between the bushings, and you can re-grease them. That's the best way to do it on those. You don't really have room to do that on the front end, but on the rear you can put grease fittings in there real easily. Richard, uh, just a question. I, I, I missed the thought, I think, about whether the, the, uh, the grease goes on the outside of the bushing or the inside where the uh, uh, bolt goes. It, it goes on the, you do not need to grease in the trailing arm before you press the bushings in because the bushings are not going to rotate in the trailing arm. Right. They're pressed in there and, you know, stay. Yeah. I thought maybe that was, uh, you grease by not getting, getting them in. Oh, no. You can tap them in there. They'll just tap in. It's not a, you know, uh, you know, press them, press them in. <laughs> um, <coughs> get the old ones out. Oh, yeah. The old ones, I would put a threaded rod through them and just tighten the nut up and pull them towards each other. One will pop out first, and then you put a big washer on that and tighten the nut on the other one and pull it took them right a section out. of the exhaust pipe pull and did that. Okay. Pull right out. Yeah, different ways you can do it. Um, mm -hmm. Also, for the rear end here, I have the adjustable trailing arm brackets. Uh, to adjust the camber. This has the pivot point that can move up and down. So uh, it's a, one of my most popular items and uh, folks say every every trailing arm car should have them because uh, put them in once and then you can adjust the camber. If you've changed ride height, the camber changes um, or even just trying to line, do an alignment. You know, that's the way to be able to do that. So that's a good, uh, good upgrade there. Uh, front end, uh, I, didn't bring, I have alloy front hubs as well, I didn't bring any of those along, uh, but another uh, upgrade is the, on the spindle. Uh, these are a heavy duty spindle and spacer kit. This is the spacer that comes with the kit to go between the bearings. The original spindles on the front, of course this goes into the upright, the original spindles are a little thinner right in here, of course where the bearings fit on it's the same, but here this one's a little bit beefier. This one has a bigger thread on The main idea of these is, uh, the original spindles flex, and in hard cornering, the flexing will cause the brake rotor to push the pads back. It's called brake knockback. So the next time you go for the brake pedal, it's going to go in further than normal. It's scary because it's, you know, you wonder when it's going to catch. So this system virtually eliminates brake knockback because it's a beefier spindle, but also this setup, you put the bearings in, and instead of just tightening the nut enough to take up the, you know, set your preload or clearance where you want it. These have shims that go in between here, and you actually tighten and torque up this nut. That's why there's a bigger thread on here, because you're going to be putting torque on here. And that makes the diameter now, the inner races here, and this sleeve are contributing to the diameter of this, so that you've got that trying to flex instead of just the spindle. And that will virtually eliminate the, the brake knockback, because this isn't flexing. Have the Timken, Timken bearing kits for the stock hubs and also for the alloy ones. The alloy hubs use a little bit bigger bearings, but Timken is recognized as the best bearing for that. I include a, a instead of the felt type seal that tends to want to weak, I have a, a regular rubber lip seal with an aluminum spacer to, to fit that in. And my upgraded springs here for uh, a little bit higher rate than the original springs better handling, lower, lower the car about an inch from stock. If you want to keep it stock ride height or whatever, you can you can add some spacers, but um, that will give you some, some better handling. Control the squat in the rear end. I have heavier rear ones also. These are 470 pound. I have 600 pound, mostly for racing, but you can use them for street too. It's not, it doesn't get that nasty as, you know, nasty stiff. It's, uh, especially if you have your engine built up for more torque. You know, you take off and the back end squats down so much, the stiffer springs will help that. The original springs were like 350 pound rate. These are 470. 
fronts are 390, the original ones were like 305. Sway bars, you mentioned sway bars, upgrade those, keep it from leaning. Um, different ones available there, just the cheap ad codes with the rubber bushings, but these have, uh, I use a, a high joint type uh, ball joint for the, for the links to the suspension. Uh, nylon bushings at the pivot points and aluminum mounting block. The front one bolts right on where the original bar and the TR6 bolted. Uh, TR 250s, maybe fours did not have the mounting points for those, but you can put the TR6 front plate in there and you can put the bar mounts to the bottom of the frame. Uh, brake upgrades, I make the disc brake kit for the for the 4A, 250 and 6. Uh, Custom made uh, parking brake caliper, separate from the from the hydraulic caliper that connects directly to the original cable. So there's not a lot of you know it's very simple to to install. There's a bracket that bolts on in behind the hub, sandwiches between the hub and the trailing arm. Uh, this kit includes the bigger studs that I was talking about, the three eighth inch studs, um, so that you are upgrading at the same time. Move with caliper, hydraulic caliper. So. Big improvement for the rear brakes and get the rear brakes doing what they doing what they should. You know, some folks say, "Oh, the rear brakes don't do much; just depend on the front ones." Well, you're not going to stop fast if you don't have rear brakes that are working right. It makes a big difference. Um, I had upgraded years ago to the the Toyota four piston front calipers with the original rotors, and that improved the front braking that much that the back ones weren't doing as much. The front ones block up at an earlier point, at lower pedal pressure, at a time when the back ones were not doing much yet. So I took it out for a drive and I came, came to, uh, I thought, oh, it's breaking pretty good, but I came to, I wanted to make a right turn onto a side road and wanted to do it, stopped kind of quick to do it, you know. I almost slid past the road because I, the front's locked up and the backs weren't doing much and I'm not stopping, I'm just sliding the fronts. So you have to have a balanced front to rear. Um, hey Rich, you need help the portion about the back? You can add a proportioning valve. I was never, I've never used a proportioning valve per se. Well, I don't know. You have drums in there, right? Rear, rear jewels or rear drums, yeah, originally. So now you've got calipers, you're going to need a proportioning valve, right? No, <coughs> no. The, if you have a balance between the front and the rear, uh, like piston sizes, like you've got uh, things balanced out, you can just use the, stock system, the stock master cylinder, and you'll have, you know, if you if you change the piston size, in other words, if you, like when I did the Toyota front, you know, the stock TR6 or whatever, 48350 brake system has no proportioning valve. It's got the four-way fitting that's on the fender well there. That's just a switch to, to light the light. There's nothing in there a little shuttle that lights the light if you have too much pressure differential. So when I upgraded the fronts, now my fronts are locking up quick. I put bigger pistons in the rear drums then and got it balanced back out. And now my rears are doing what they should in relation to what the fronts are doing. Richard, is, when you put those kits on, does that bring the tires back out wider? Out of no, it's very, it's just a little bit thicker than the original bracket plate. Maybe four inches. 16. You know, I was going to say, the quality of the parts today is, is terrible. So, if what he said about reviving the back brakes is very important because if, if you go out and, like you typically would call up Moss, get a rear set of shoes for your car, put them on the car, and then if you ever have time to take, if they even fit, because a lot of times what we'll have to do is we'll have to take the drum and the shoes and get them to fit. Like back in the day, you always used to take your brake shoes down and your drums down and have a match, put them back in the car and everything was fine. Today, you call up Moss, you get a, a set of rear brake shoes, but they don't fit. They're, they're too much material on the, on, the, on the shoes. So right away you have an issue. But then, supposedly you get a set that fits on the car correctly that you don't have to do any work. But then if you were to ever take off the brake drum after you drove the car for 100 miles and looked at the, at the witness marks or the patterns on the rear shoes, you would be shocked. Yeah. Because you're probably only getting 50% of the braking power at best. And I'm getting up at some spot. It, it just, it, if you look at the witness marks on the shoes, there's like 
there's like very little contact. You know, until you drove the hell out of the car. And then I guess.